has been around for a long, long time. Not just skepticism about religion, but skepticism about almost anything and everything in life. There's skeptics. People have been skeptical about the thought that the world is flat and skeptical about the thought that the world is round. Many times skeptics have been proven wrong. Let me give you a few examples. Back in 1825, the Quarterly Review of New England said, what can be more obviously absurd than the prospect that a car can go twice as fast as a horse carriage? In 1839, um, a French surgeon said the abolishment of pain in surgery is a fantasy. It's absurd to go seeking surgery. Knife and pain are two words in surgery that we must for be forever be associated in the consciousness of a patient. In 1865, uh, editorial in the Boston Post said, well-informed people know it's impossible to transmit voice over wires, and even if it were possible, the thing would have no practical value at all. 1897, Lord Kelvin said radio has no future. 1877, um, Ken Olson, the president of Digital Equipment Corp, said, there is no need for any individual to have a personal computer in their home. Thomas Watson, President of IBM in 1943 said, there's probably a market in the world for five computers total. Skeptics have always been proven wrong. Skeptics have been around for a long time, and they were even around during the time of Jesus as well. Even his own disciples were skeptics at times. So we shouldn't be shocked that increasingly in our modern times, we have people who are skeptical of Jesus and skeptical of the Bible. Jesus still gets criticized. Some beliefs in the resurrections of the Jesus, the inspiration, the scripture, the exclusivity of faith alone in Christ, are, they think those are considered absurd, foolish, archaic to believe. You know, you're more accepted if you buy into a conspiracy theory than if you believe in Jesus and the Bible. And there's a lot of conspiracy theorists around there. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus and you have questions about Jesus and you have questions about Christianity, can I say to you, welcome? We're going to look this morning at how Jesus answered and dealt with skeptics 2,000 years ago, and we'll find that Jesus and Christianity is actually not a leap in the dark type of faith, but it's reasonable. It's logical. The faith that we hold on to doesn't require that when we walk into, our, into the stores that we check our brain out and we now just believe whatever the pastor says. And we're going to look at this for about three weeks. We're going to look at it this week and we're going to look at it next two weeks. Now listen, um, I don't presume to think that I'm going to argue you into faith, into Jesus. That will never happen. I believe the Bible informs me that you coming to Jesus and you believing that he is Lord and Savior is not a work of me arguing you into that. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. But I do believe that if you are here this morning that God is working on you because you're not here by accident. You're here because God brought you here. And may the word of God do its work in your life today. And may this be a place where you can ask all the questions that you want. But if you know Jesus this morning, if you are a follower of Jesus this morning, are there times where you can be skeptical can a true Christian ever doubt the Bible, the reality of Jesus, even their own salvation? I think the Bible says that, the Bible shows that there are times when believers doubt. That we have questions, we have doubts, even about our own salvation. A true believer will never cease to have faith, but they may struggle with assurance at times. The faith may be weak, but know that, like we've said over and over, it's not the strength of your faith, but it's the object of your faith that's important. It's, there we go. It's not the strength of your faith, it's the object of your faith. Imagine you're on a domestic flight, right? You're flying, and all of a sudden, the pilot comes on and says, hey, the plane is going down, and it's crashing, right? Now, all of a sudden, a couple guys come to you with backpacks, and you know, you've heard, overheard them that they were skydiving instructors. They pull the door open, they put a backpack on you, and they shove you out. Now, you've got a decision you've got to make. There's a choice you have to make. They told you what to do. They assured you the backpack will work. Your faith is weak. You do not believe it's going to work. You're not sure if the backpack is going to open, but you reach out and you pull the string, the parachute releases, and you're saved. 
But if you tell them no thanks and you put on your Dora backpack on and you jump out and you say, uh, what is it, um, backpack, backpack, and you hope the map will open up, no matter how much faith you have in that Dora backpack, you're going to die. That's just the reality. But if you jump out with that parachute, what saved you? Was it the strength of your faith in the parachute that saved you? Was it your strength in the faith of the skydivers that saved you? It was the parachute that saved you. It wasn't how big your faith was. It wasn't how small your faith was. It was the object of your faith. So listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, the object of your faith is Jesus. It's not in how strong you are or how well you believe. It's who do you believe in? It's Jesus. There may be doubts in your Christian life, but doubts can be a good thing because sometimes doubts will force you to find answers and only serves to solidify your faith. We've got people in this room that have gone through seasons of doubt, but their seasons of doubts have made them stronger, stronger believers, stronger followers of Jesus. And the more you fight, the more you get assurance, the more you grow in Jesus. Wrestling is not a bad thing at times because it can prove that you've encountered a real God and not some fragment of your imagination. You may walk with a limp the rest of your life like Jacob did, but you'll realize that he was real. And in our passage this morning, we're going to begin looking at Jesus' skeptics and how he answered them and how the rest of Scripture answers them. And when it comes to Christianity, there are really three different types of skeptics. And I believe they're addressed in chapter 7. We're going to look at them um, one each of these weeks. First of all, they're intimate skeptics that are apathetic. Intimate skeptics that are apathetic. These are those who've grown up in and around Christianity. They, they went to youth camp. They were at Bible study every week. They come to church every week. Their parents might have brought them to Sunday school and youth group their entire lives, but somehow they've grown apathetic. They've grown indifferent to their faith. Two studies conducted by the Barna Group said, and USA Today found that nearly 75% of church young people by age 23 leave the church and leave their faith. And one of the key reasons for leaving is intellectual skepticism. And in our passage this morning, the intimate skeptics are Jesus' own family. They're his brothers. And here are guys who grew up with Jesus. He grew around Jesus. And they were eyewitnesses their entire life of the character and the life of Jesus. And yet they still didn't believe, even though, the resur- even, though even after the resurrection, they eventually will. But during this season, they wouldn't. Secondly, there are the familiar skeptics who are argumentative. They have a basic framework idea about Christianity. They have shown some interest. They may even take in a few courses in college, maybe even have some Christian co-workers, but they don't fully understand what it's all about. In our passage, we're going to see the crowds are these intellectual, familiar skeptics who are argumentative. These guys who have been following Jesus, they've known him maybe for a few months or a year. They've seen some miraculous things that he's done. And some of their ideas of Jesus come from rumors, some which have been generated by the religious establishment of the day that hated Jesus. Familiar skeptics who are argumentative. They love to argue. And then there are the distant skeptics who are antagonistic. They just want to fight. This is a group who really has it out for Christianity. They feel that Christianity seeks to suppress them. The group hasn't really studied Christianity at all, and they feel like there's no need for them to study Christianity. They know everything about it. And in our passage, we're going to see that these are their Jewish leaders, their religious leaders who hate Jesus. They don't want to listen to Jesus. They don't want to hear his side. They just want to argue with him. They want him dead, and eventually they will get him dead. But that's all part of God's plan. So this morning we're going to look at the intimate skeptics. Those who are familiar with the claims of Christianity, of Jesus, and yet they're apathetic. They're just, they're not excited about their faith. They're just just going through the motions. They're, you might be here this morning and you're just like, my faith is just something I do. It's not, I don't own it. I just, I'm here maybe because my parents forced me here or maybe because all my life I went to church on Sunday mornings and that's all I do. I mean, you're just apathetic. And so I want to look at three objections to Christianity from our text and three subsequent answers to these objections. Number one, objection number one, Christianity is primitive. We're going to discover this in the first four verses. Christianity is primitive. This is the idea that people who are Christians are so because they just simply aren't that smart. They're dumb. It's basically a crutch for you because you need it. 
Christianity can't make it in the public square. It doesn't thrive with people that have intelligence or important people. Look at verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So between chapter 6 and chapter 7, there's about six months gap where Jesus was in Galilee. And during this time, the gospel tells us that during this time that Jesus performed miracles, which included healings, casting out demons. He fed another crowd of 4,000 men. Most of these six months, he was spending discipling and investing into the lives of 12 individuals that he had chosen to follow him, the disciples. It was during this time that he told them for the first time that the essence of his mission is that he had come to die and that people were going to kill him. Over in Matthew 16, it says that from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, that he had to be killed and on the third day that he would be raised. Look at verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Booths was at hand. The Feast of Booths was one of the three major festivals of the Jews. Pentecost was one. Passover was the other. It was like Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas to us. right? It was all near each other. It was... Uh, it was called the Festival of the Tabernacles. It was the end of September, and close to the beginning of October. And it was a mandatory festival, so every Jewish male who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem was legally bound to attend this festival. But even Jews outside of that radius would go. It was popular. It was the most popular of the three festivals. It lasted about eight days. It was like spring break in Cancun. That's what it was. Verse 3. So his brothers said to him, leave here, go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. So now we meet the brothers of Jesus. Jesus had four half-brothers, at least two half-sisters that we know about, according to Matthew 13. The brothers basically now are giving Jesus advice on how to do ministry. This is their advice coming onto the scene saying, hey, you want to draw a crowd? You want to draw people in? You want to draw some people in that you've, that you've lost? Here's what you need to do. They're very good at giving business practices, but with a very skeptical attitude. They tell them, hey, stop wasting your time in the backwoods of Galilee. Stop healing peasants. Stop hanging out with a bunch of nobodies. Jerusalem is the place to be. Jerusalem is where the action is. Jerusalem is where the people that matter really live. This is where the streets are packed. Everyone who was anyone is in Jerusalem. Stop hanging out in Galilee. Go to Jerusalem and get a big crowd. They thought that Jesus needed more publicity. If Jesus was going to perform his miracles in Jerusalem, not only was he going to get the biggest crowds of his career, but the word would spread quickly, and he would have this huge following. They were trying to help their big brother out. They think he needs better marketing. They think he needs a better campaign manager. They're never going to win the Jerusalem caucus by hanging out in Galilee. Verse 4. For no one works in secret, if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now listen, these, these brothers, they're mocking Jesus. They're just basically insulting him. That word, if, echoed the words of the crowd in Matthew 27 that said, if you really are God, then come down from the cross. Basically the same idea. If you really want to have a world premiere movie, you don't do it in Farmer's World, Texas, where there's a few cowboys, some horses, and some cattle. You do it in Hollywood, where there's flashing lights, cameras, reporters, paparazzi. That's where you show off. The brothers are saying there's no way your little gig will make it where it counts. You only have a following around these guys because they're just not smart or because you perform some cheap miracles with, and some, these small town people just prime to believe such things. They'll fall for anything. But listen, this isn't true because Christianity has spread everywhere. There's not a continent or a country that Christianity has a, hasn't had an impact on. There are Christians in rural locations and in urban locations, in higher education and people with no education, those who have more degrees than Fahrenheit and those who just wear degree um, deodorant. And at this time, Jesus did have more followers than the elite of society. He had Nicodemus in John 3. He had the official in John 4. He had a Roman centurion in Matthew 8. And he had others like Joseph of Arimathea in John 19. Jesus had people who were elite. He had nobodies. Historically, you have the following in law. 
You had men like Sir William Blackstone who wrote the classic work in legal scholarship in England that even our society is built on. In literature, there's George Herbert, John Milton, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, Dorothy Sayers, Samuel Johnson. In philosophy, all the great philosophers of the West were Christians since the fifth century. Augustine, Aquinas, and Anselm, arts, all the mass majority of painters and sculptors and architects were Christian. Music, Bach, Handel, Handel were all Christians. In science, you had Isaac Newton, John King Kepler, Lord Kelvin, Blaise Pascal, all devote followers of Jesus, intellectual men, Christianity and women. Christianity has spread to every place, through every tier of society. It has reached people in the slums of Mumbai and people in the palaces of kingdoms and empires. To think that we have somehow grown as a society to suppress Christianity, to evolve somehow in intelligence over the primitive people before us is what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. Just think about the resurrection of Jesus for a moment. This wasn't made up by some primitive people who wanted to advance their cause in the backwoods of Galilee. No one was primed to believe such a thing. The Gentiles thought that the soul was good, the body was bad. For them, salvation was liberation from the body. They thought physical resurrection was not only impossible, but that wasn't something you wanted. You didn't want to come back in your body. And the Jewish people believed that the Messiah would come and renew the whole world and resurrect the righteous. The idea of an individual being resurrected in the middle of history while the rest of the world continued unburdened by sickness and death was offensive to the Jews. N.T. Wright would say it this way. He said the early Christians didn't invent the empty tomb and the meetings or the sightings of the risen Jesus. Nobody was expecting this kind of thing. No kind of conversion experience would have invented this. No matter how guilty or all forgiven they, forgiven they had felt, no matter how many hours they poured over the scriptures, to suggest otherwise is to stop doing history and enter into a fantasy world of our own. My friends, the gospel is not tied to people who are unintelligent or people who are desperate or people who needed a crutch. It is a life-transforming truth that has revolutionized the entire world as we know it. But listen, as I say that, we need to note that God has chosen people to make his glory seen by choosing the foolish to shame the wise. Jesus said that he didn't come to call the righteous, but to call sinners, those who were sick, not those who were well. It is true that he constantly surrounded himself with the nobodies of society. God has always chosen to work mainly through what the society sees as meaningless or useless because it is those guys that he uses because it become, becomes evident that it is a work of God's grace and God's grace alone. God is at work in the least likely of people to do the greatest possible work. He's at work behind the scenes to bring foolish people to himself to glorify his name. He's using the weak to shame the strong, the foolish to shame the wise, the seemingly always making the outsiders his insiders. First Corinthians would say it this way, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the world's standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is why Jesus in Matthew 5 and Luke 6, Solomon in Proverbs 3, David in Psalm 138, James in James 4, Peter in 1 Peter 5 would say things like, blessed are the poor, that God is opposed to the proud, that God gives grace to the humble. Just read the resume of G Jesus. Read his genealogy in Matthew and Luke. It's filled with people who are adulterers, people who are murderers, liars, prostitutes. Canaanites, the hated enemy of Israel, were in Jesus' genealogy. Moabites, people who were products of incest, were in Jesus' genealogy. Think about who the father chose as the parent of Jesus, a poor teenage girl and a guy who swung a hammer for a living. Not a king, not a queen, not a political leader, not an opinion swayer, just a poor young couple in a barn scared out of their mind. Then think about who he chose to be his followers a bunch of fishermen, a hated tax collector, a rebellious sellout, you and me. 
It was Bad News Bear, the kids from the sandlot that Jesus chose. It was people that the world would never have considered significant. John Bunyan is an example. John Bunyan in his day and age was known as a tinker for being a metal worker. That's what he did. He received an ordinary education of the poor to read and write, but nothing more. He had no formal education of any kind. And yet the greatest Puritan theologian of that day and age was a man by the name of John Owen. And when asked by John Owen why he goes to listen to John Bunyan, he said, I would rather willingly exchange my learning for that tinker's power of touching a man's heart. John Bunyan wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress, which next to the Bible is the world's most selling, best-selling book, translated into 200 different languages, a metal worker. To think that Christianity is only alive because of primitive thinking is not accurate. It has spread to every area of society, but it's true that it's spread with primitive people, not because they're primitive, but because God has sought after those who are sick, those who are sinners, because they know that it has not, if you, they, because they know that it is because of Jesus. Listen, if you haven't come to Christ today, could it be that your pride is what stands between you and Jesus? Objection number two. Christianity is culturally relative. Basically, the argument is you're a Christian because it's, not because it's intellectually true, but it's because of the culture in which you were born into. If you were born in Turkey, you'd be a Muslim. If you were born in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were born in Thailand, you'd be a Buddhist. If you were born in America, you'd be a Christian. And listen, while I'm not downplaying the idea that there are clearly cultural Christianity in America, just like there's cultural Buddhism in Thailand, people believe it just because it's acceptable or accepted, but true Christianity isn't culturally relative. Think about it. Wouldn't you think it's true that the people closest to Jesus would have believed him? That the people in his family would have accepted him? I mean, look, look at what John says, verse 5. Not even his brothers believed in him. No doubt the half-brothers of Jesus thought his disciples were following Jesus because they were primed for such a Messiah to come along, but they knew better. Think about how counterproductive this verse is if the Bible couldn't be trusted. I mean... If this was all a lie, you would omit a verse like this. The only reason this is included in Scripture is because the Bible is historically true. There's no other explanation. You, would, you should believe in Jesus. Why? Well, look, his own brothers believed in him. They're not going to get a lot of converts by saying his own family didn't accept him. Understand that you believe what you do based not just on intellectual facts, but also because of experience and family and culture. People tend to believe those people they like or want to be like, whether they be family or friends or celebrities. This is the case of everyone, even those who are the nuns out there who say there is no God of our culture, the secular. Secular people will say their beliefs are rational and Christian beliefs are, cult are cultural and social, but if a secular person was born in Turkey, he probably wouldn't be a secular, he'd probably be a Muslim. This explains why people won't buy your arguments for Christianity because it's not just intellectual, but experiences and cultural influences and even cultural consequences. People in Turkey have to count a severe cost to come to Christ because it's not socially acceptable, which makes us reflect on Christianity in America and go, maybe there aren't as many Christians as we think there are. Maybe many are just following what's acceptable, but they're not really followers of Jesus. The brothers rejected Jesus, not because they didn't have enough evidence. Evidence was right in front of their face. But because of another reason. Maybe they just didn't want to be rejected by the people in their society. Maybe they just wanted to be accepted by the religious leaders. But this unbelief goes deeper than just intellectual, personal, and social reasons. It's an issue of depravity and inability, as we've seen in John chapter 6. John 6 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me, and I will raise him up on that last day. If belief was ever based on cultural relativism or family upbringing, you would think that his half-brothers would have believed him. After all, his mother and his stepdad believed in him, and these guys spent 30 years of their life with Jesus. Can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother? He never does anything wrong. 
all the while you're getting in trouble, Jesus will never get in trouble. He never dishonors his parents. He never forgets to make his bed. He always eats his vegetables. He does everything right, and his brothers are always getting in trouble. Can you imagine being a sibling of Jesus? He always shares. He's always giving his toys and his music. He's never lazy. He's never argumentative. No doubt the four brothers have conspired their whole lives trying to make Jesus do something wrong, trying to make him mad, trying to get him to retaliate, trying to make him lay one in on him. And it never worked. Listen, Christianity isn't culturally relative because it's humanly impossible. The gospel isn't about what you, about you and what you need to do for God. It's about Jesus and what he's done for you. There's no ladder for you to climb. Just a recognition that you are flat out on your back with no ability to climb at all. If those who grew up with Jesus and witnessed his perfections and miracles didn't believe in him, then it has nothing to do with the culture that you grew up in. No one is primed. No one is privileged to believe the gospel. A devout Muslim and a devout kid in Christian school are just as lost and just as in need of a miracle of God's grace and for God to show up in their lives. So don't blame yourself at the unbelief of your friends and your family. This is why prayer is so important. Listen, as a father, I have no guarantee that even my own children will follow Jesus their own lives. This is why Paul says that we have to pray. This Paul says in for second Timothy, that the first thing that we have to do as a church is pray. Prayer and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people. Bruce Metzger would say it this way, until we see the incapacity of sinners and our helplessness to save them, we will not commit ourselves to prayer. So is Christianity culturally relative? Not more than any other religious belief system. The unbelief of the brothers were deeper than intellectual, cultural or even for a personal reason. It was humanly impossible and an issue of sovereign grace. Objection number three, Christianity, Christianity is senseless. Now here we see the brothers just don't understand why Jesus doesn't want to get popular and go to the festival. Jesus' decision doesn't make any sense to them. People feel this way. My experience doesn't match up with what you say about Jesus being good and all-powerful. Look at verse four. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. He's telling them that, hey, if I go up to Jerusalem right now, they're going to try to kill me. They don't hate his brothers because you guys go with the flow. You guys do what you're supposed to do. You want to be liked. You want to be accepted. You want to be respected. So you do whatever's pleasing to the crowd or whatever's pleasing to the religious leaders. You're accepted, but I'm not. Verse 8, you go up to the feast. And I'm not going to go up to the feast, for my time has not fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The language indicates that Jesus says, hey, why don't you guys go on, go now, and that he's not going to go just yet. And Jesus arrives later at the festival. His brothers doesn't understand, why doesn't Jesus just go and make a name for himself? But Jesus' schedule and his timetable was on a completely different schedule than the people. Listen, don't miss this point. The brothers didn't understand Jesus because Jesus was operating on a divine timetable. They expected Jesus to perform on their timetable, and when he did it, they basically said, this doesn't make sense. Sound familiar? When Jesus doesn't show up the way you want him to show up, when you say, hey, I prayed and I did this and God didn't answer my prayer, and then all of a sudden it's, it doesn't make sense. It's senseless. Jesus knew what he was going to do. His timing was perfect. Jesus' whole life was planned and on a divine schedule, which is why he said that this, his time hasn't yet come. He knew all the events before they ever happened. You see, God doesn't see time like you and I do. He's outside of it, and he sees it all at once. He sees Adam and Eve, Peter and Paul, you and me simultaneously. He's allocated all of our days and every detail of our lives. Nothing takes him by surprise. You say, but that doesn't make sense. How could God allow such suffering in this world if he knows all things? See, but we have a fundamental knowledge problem. We can only see one scene of the movie when he sees the whole film. 
we're in the midst of the plot, the conflict, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, where he's already at the resolution. He's already at the resurrection. See, if history were the size of this room, then one hair is our view. It's like time is like a winding river and our lives are on this solitary boat. We can see a little behind us. We can see a little in front of us. But we have no idea what's around the bend. But God, as it were, we're at the highest mountain. And he can see every bend and he can see every curve. And he knows what's around every corner. And he knows where he's taking our boat because even, even when we don't know it. So when someone says, I can't see any good reason for this suffering, there must not be one. That's an arrogant statement of absoluteness of exclusivity. It's the idea that you sit on a pretty high mountain to hold such a claim. But isn't it conceivable that if God is eternal and wise and can see beginning from the end, that maybe there could be a reason that we just cannot see? Would you agree that since we have very limited knowledge of our world, very limited knowledge even of our own lives, that maybe God, who has the ultimate vantage viewpoint of seeing all of history at once, might see things just a tad bit differently than we do? Isaiah 40, have you not seen? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as, high as, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, God has the ultimate viewpoint on the world, the broadest, the deepest understanding of it. His word about himself and about the world in the Bible, therefore, is more credible than any other word that you will ever hear. It obligates belief, trust, and obedience because I believe he knows about things a little better than you and I do, even when things don't make sense in our lives. C.S. Lewis would describe it this way. He would say, imagine yourself living in a house, and all of a sudden, God comes in as a contractor to rebuild that house for you. At first, Perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right. He's stopping the leaks on the roof and so on. You knew the job needed to be done and you're not surprised at what he's doing. But presently, all of a sudden, he starts knocking out walls. He starts creating the house in a way differently than what you imagined. And it hurts. And it doesn't seem to make sense. What on earth is God up to? The explanation is that God is building a different house from the one that you thought of. Throwing a new wing there, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to live in a decent little cottage. All the while, he was building a palace for you. He intends to come and live in it with you. Listen, you have no idea what he is doing, but you serve a God who knows exactly what he's doing. So is Christianity senseless? Does it not make sense at times? It might not add up all the time in our minds, and we might be limited on our information and knowledge, but we have all that we need in God's word. He is good. He knows what he is doing, and he is perfectly just, and he loves us as his children, and he has our back, and he said he will never leave us or forsake us. We have his promises, and that's all we need to trust him. He's faithful. You say, how is he loving? Because Jesus' time did come. The eternal God came into time and became a man and lived the life that you couldn't live and died the death that you should have died. Why? So that this morning, if you know Jesus, when God looks at you, he calls you son. He calls you daughter. He lived the life you should have lived, died the death you should have died, so that you can be part of of the family of God. The eternal plan of God was accomplished when Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished. Galatians 4, when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might redeem, receive adoption as sons. 
It was the most heinous scene in the history of the world. The perfect son of God, creator of the ends of the earth, hung by three nails on an old rugged cross. A pool of blood sat at his feet. His body was brutalized that we can rarely recognize him. His voice was raw from screaming that you could barely make out what he was saying. And surely this was chaos. Surely this was unjust. Surely this was senseless. But surely this was brilliant because Acts 2 tells us this was all part of God's predetermined plan of God to make us sons and daughters of Almighty God. You see, the wisdom of God was at work there at that moment in the middle of sin, in the middle of chaos. From a human perspective, things seemed wrong and unjust, and it was, but God was working a plan that would allow himself to kill of sin that is killing you and I and not kill us in the process. The cross was the only way to satisfy justice and to rescue us. And at the moment that God said, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he became both the just and the justifier. He became our judge condemning our sin and our savior by taking on our sin for us. If there was anything that was senseless, it was the cross of Jesus. And why, and why he would go through that for you and me. If anything ever didn't make seem just, it was the cross of Christ where the only true innocent man suffered and died so that you and I, the guilty, could go free. This morning as we go to communion, this is the opportunity for us to respond to Jesus. Listen, if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, can I ask you, is it, is it your pride? Is it your pride this morning? Have you tried to argue your way out of Jesus saying he's just not relevant, he's just not answerable. Can I invite you, bring your question to Jesus. He's more than able, more than capable to handle it. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you respond to Jesus as well this morning. It's not enough to just take notes or nod your head in agreement to what I'm saying. If you're a follower of Jesus, he says you can bring your burdens to him as well. Bring your questions, bring your doubts, bring your uncertainties. Jesus is big enough to hold them as well.